aquarium lady can get very pricey. But building your own can give you full control and can save you money. I'll walk you through how to turn these LED strips into a full-blown aquarium light. And trust me, it's easier than you think. To build the light, we'll need some LED strips. There are a lot of options out there, like the Philips Hue, Govi, or LifeX. But those can get very expensive. Instead, we'll be using affordable LED strips, specifically WS2812B strips. Though they only have RGB channels, if you want to add pure white light into the mix, you can go for SK6812 strips. To control the LED strip, we'll use this, an ESP32. It's a small microcontroller with built-in Wi-Fi and costs only about $5 USD. This will be the brain of the operation. Of course, we also need power. The key thing here is to stick with 5 volt components because the ESP32 can only handle up to 5 volts. If you do decide to use 12 volt strips, you'll need additional hardware to make it work. Of course, all the parts I'm using are linked in the Elysium link below. First things first, we need to prep the ESP32 by connecting it to a computer. From here, we need to go to install.wled.me. Select the latest stable release, click install, find your device, and wait for it to do its thing. If you're a Linux scrub like me, you'll need to add yourself to the dialog group before installing. Once the installation is done, it will prompt you to connect the ESP to your Wi-Fi network. Afterwards, we can visit the device. This is where we'll be controlling the LEDs. Don't get too hasty and start messing with things, because we're not done yet. Click on config and then Wi-Fi setup. Take note of the client IP and then add it to the static IP and static gateway. This is the IP address of the ESP and is how we will access the UI from any device as long as they are on the same network. If you skip this part, the IP of the device will change upon every reboot. Now it's time to connect the LEDs to the ESP32. I went with a 144 LED per meter strip because it gives smoother effects, except this choice will end up biting me later on in the video. I advise you to stay within the 60 LED per meter range. 5 volt LED strips will have a 3 pin female port, one for power, ground, and data. While you could solder these directly to the board, to keep things simple, we'll use jumper cables. We need to connect the power pin to the VIN terminal, ground to ground, and data to the D16 pin. And there we go, the LEDs are getting power. Why aren't all of the LEDs lit up? If we go back to the device settings and to LED preferences, we need to change a few things. First, make sure to select the correct LED type. Mine are SK6812, so that's what I'll choose. The next change to make is the length number, which is the number of LEDs you're using. Since I'll be using one meter of LED strips, I'll enter 144. And boom, that's it. It's really that simple. But there's still one more thing we need to take care of. Right now, the ESP32 is getting power through the USB cable, which is why the LEDs look a bit dim. And to make it brighter and not chained to a PC, we need to hook it up to an external power supply. Before that, I'll be reusing the power cable for my broken lights, but you can use one of these instead. As for the wiring, we need to make a T intersection with jumper cables. Instead of soldering one, we'll keep it simple by using a T-tap wire connector with two male-to-female cables. If you're using a two-pin connector like this, make sure you have the cables in the correct spots. To put everything together is still very straightforward as one end of the cable will go to the board and the other end to the LEDs. No change will be done to the data cable. And for the moment of truth, let's plug this in and see if it works. Hitting, it works perfectly. Now let's move on to adding it to a chassis and finishing up this build. This chassis that I got from my broken LED light is wide enough to fit two rows of LED strips, but to connect the two, I'll need to wire them together. I could use LED connectors, but for some reason, they don't make 3-pin 12mm connectors, so soldering it is. Soldering this was kind of a pain, but I found out if I just put my head right here, I could get the right angle to solder it together. I also added a stencil sheet to the light chassis to act as a diffuser. Now, you might be thinking, electronics near water. That sounds risky, and you'd be right, which is why we will be waterproofing the ESP board with clear nail polish. A single coat over the board should be fine, but I like to add at least two coats to be safe. 
The next thing is to attach the board to the light chassis. For that, I replicated and 3D printed the side casing to accommodate the ESP. But before we put this light to the test, there's still one more setting we need to adjust. Heading back there, we can now change the amount of amps to use. The default is 850 milliamps, and my power supply provides 15,000 milliamps. So I'll just set it to about 12,500 just to keep things under control and avoid maxing out the power supply. And holy, it's so bright. The camera does not do the brightness justice at all. Now it's time to put this thing to the test. You say it's hard to tell just what I'm thinking. You think it's hard to see behind my smile. I'll say whatever you want. Let you walk in on my heart if you want to. You can ask me anything, no one's between us. Controlling a light remotely is super easy. Just use the device's IP address in a web browser, and there is also a mobile app for both Android and Apple. Overall, this looks pretty decent for a DIY build. Of course, it's not on the same level as my Chihiro's WRGB2, but it's significantly cheaper. And yes, WLED has a built-in timer function. The only downside is that setting it up can be a bit of a mess. We need to set up two different presets, one for the color you want the light to use, and the other for when the light is off. Each preset needs a unique ID greater than one. Then in the time setup section under the configs, check get time time from NTP server. Scroll down to the time control presets and add the hour and minutes you want the light to turn on and off. Make sure the preset number matches the ID you set earlier. Clicking on the calendar allows you to set which dates it activates, which isn't super necessary for us. Remember when I mentioned that using a 144 LED per meter strip might come back to bite me? Well, I should have gone with a 60 LED per meter strip instead. Wait, does that mean higher numbers don't always mean better? The reason is that lower density LED strips at the same power level result in much brighter individual LEDs because fewer of them are sharing the same current. But there's one major drawback with this light. I have no way of verifying the power values and its light spectrum. And as we've seen in my previous videos, those two variables are crucial for growing plants, especially artisan plants. That said, if you're growing low light or easy to grow plants, this project offers way more flexibility than cheap LED lights which often limit you on just a few presets and photo periods. If you do decide to give this build a try, I'd love to see your progress. Share any photos or videos over on our Discord server. In the meantime, if you want to see my progress in making my own auto fertilizer pump, check out this video right here.